the Girard Avenue neighborhood in West Philadelphia. It has been home to the Philadelphia Zoo for more than a century, and today trolley cars run along the avenue, the descendants of rail service which began before the American Civil War. But it was in this neighborhood with a deep history that the Philadelphia School District established in 2006 a technology high school, the School of the Future. This school was built with the concept of introducing um, students to technology, to advanced technology, to the technology that they'll need in the future. Um, and so because that technology is always changing, um, we've decided to, to keep the technology aspect, but um, to really try to make our mission and vision unique in terms of how we expose the kids, what they do with it, how we communicate with um, our kids through technology, um, how the team of teachers stays in communication using technology. So um, we're really trying to make our approach unique to, to, to this concept. The school was built on, on a, as a joint brainchild of the School District of Philadelphia and Microsoft. Um, the Microsoft team stays in pretty regular communication. Um, they were instrumental in getting kind of our refresh of devices. Um, and so where we are right now is needing to really explore and lay out what that relationship looks like. And so we, we still have a working relationship. Um, we, we just really need to work with the district and Microsoft to really redefine exactly what components those are. So um, from our perspective, we can't wait for anybody. So we just, we keep working. The current fleet of devices we give to students were donated. It was a part of a partnership between Microsoft and Hewlett Packard. Uh, it works. Like when we were capable of buying hardware, it was better hardware. Uh, well, mostly except they had mechanical hard drives, but all the other hardware was better. Um, these these devices work. I mean, they're kind of like bare minimum, but but they work. It would be nice if we could have like a regular refresh cycle, uh, but as it stands, we kind of make the most out of what we what we have. It was overwhelming, um, and slightly intimidating, just coming into an atmosphere where all of the other educators know how to use all the platforms. They were using this language that I had never heard before. Um, so going from an uh, atmosphere where I use my computer, right, I had a smart board and I just kind of just used certain programs, to an atmosphere where all of the learners had computers. We have so many different platforms that we're using, so much technology, and feeling like I had to incorporate all of that into each lesson um, under, while we only had like a week before school started um, was slightly intimidating. And in, in the early years, it was kind of mayhem. <laughs> uh, depending on who was the principal at the time. I wasn't here when the school really opened, but I was here like shortly after that. Um, and they really hadn't had a handle of really how to approach the situation of giving every kid a laptop an environment that requires them to have the device to get the work done, uh, where they might not have the device because they broke it. <laughs> the staff was extremely supportive. So they really took the time to make sure that they provided us with professional development to kind of let people just become a little uh, more acclimated and just more comfortable with the programs. Um, and they just kind of reminded us to just do a little bit at a time. So starting off with like Microsoft OneNote, right? So rather than using Active Inspire showing us how we could actually use Microsoft OneNote. Um, and then some math educators that were here previously, they also shared their math OneNotes with me as well. So I kind of had a template to work off of, and then I was able to kind of incorporate my own information and the way I do things into it. Um, and again, just remind us just do a little bit at a time. So like each quarter, I started to become more and more comfortable. So by the end of first year, I felt extremely comfortable, right? I already produced the whole years of lessons. I had, um, we were using Land School, which is a way that we are able to kind of communicate with learners um, on their computers, have, make sure that they're not doing certain things, make sure that they are doing certain things, and then all of these other platforms. Um, I just felt extremely comfortable after the first year. I mean, teaching is teaching. I love educating, so I could definitely do it. I think it, it would not be the same. Um, so, like, that first year, ninth graders, I've, I've been teaching as a ninth grade educator since I've been here. So that first year, ninth graders had laptops, right? So I learned all of these things. It was amazing. And I kind of had an idea of what I wanted to do for the second year. But the second year, ninth graders did not get laptops. 
So the rest of the school had laptops and ninth graders were able to use them in the classroom, but they couldn't take them home. Um, so then it kind of, I had to scale back what I wanted to do because it was like, we have this technology, we're using it, but they're not able to take it home. So I can't do the same exact things or kind of work on the different ideas that I had for what I wanted my classroom to look like outside of my classroom. Um, so I did have to scale it back a little bit, but I was still able to use computers on a, on a um, everyday basis and use other things. Um, and then this year we kind of came back where lear um, learners are able to take it home, so I'm able to incorporate those things back. So it was like I had to um, think about different ways to do these things. So I like I created a website, right? So rather than having everything on the one note where they're able to kind of as soon as they get home. Um, they sync to, to wireless and they have everything that we've done in class. They have the homework, they have the classwork, they have the videos and everything. I just created a website where I put all this information um, and they can access it from their phones or anything else. So you just have to become creative. The ones who, who it's not working for, I think is just the idea of I have to use this and I don't know how to use it and I'm scared to use it. So I'd rather just not try. So again, I think once you make people have to do these things, like there's nothing, I don't see any drawbacks from using technology, right? You use technology every single day. So I think the more work, sometimes we kind of just push them outside of their comfort zone, they really see the benefits of doing it. Um, again, some learners, like sometimes things happen, their laptop might break, they may not have it one day or another day. So they, we still have paper and pencil, right? So it's not like if you don't have a laptop, you can't do anything. We still have different things that they can do. Um, sometimes when we're, when we're doing projects, different things like that, they may not necessarily use a computer. So we do scaffold um, and they do use different things. So it's not like you have to have a laptop, but when you don't have one, you are at a disadvantage. Number one, we know technology now goes from very expensive to not expensive. Um, the same trade-offs, you start using some inexpensive technology and then you find out you need to completely replace it pretty soon. Um, you go with the more expensive technology and you also find out you need to replace it pretty soon. So um, my precautions right now are to really narrow down the scope and focus of what you want the educational technology to do. A lot of um, education is shifting to blended learning. So these companies are making all kinds of online content and when your content and everything is online, the device you use to access it does not have to be very complex. So any system or district that really wants to focus in on the blended learning model, the educational technology, you do not need to spend a whole lot of money on expensive devices because everything is just managed through the internet. Choose your devices wisely, but understand now the refresh rate of them is, is getting less and less. I mean, we're, we're kind of, we're three years into the batch that we just recently ordered. Physically, it's still holding on for the most part. We've actually been pleasantly surprised um, that our kids take care of it pretty well. Um, but the software and the software updating and having enough memory, um, that's where we're, we run into some of the issues and, you know, kind of need to format and reformat and uh, re-image the devices pretty frequently. So it's really more the software than the hardware we're finding out is causing the most headaches right now. There's been challenges maintaining a one-to-one -one computing environment because uh, students are tough on the hardware. Uh, but the hardware has improved, technology's improved really, that makes some hardware more robust and holds up better to the student abuse. One very important thing, if you're going to do one-to-one -one with students having devices, uh, choose devices with solid-state storage. Uh, as I said, students tend to be a little rough with the equipment, not intentionally, but they just don't really know. So one of the biggest points of failure on a laptop is going to be the hard drive. So a mechanical hard drive is going to fail when it's being mishandled while active. <laughs> uh, solid state storage has gone a long way to helping us alleviate that issue. I think um, one of the first things is just making sure that educators are comfortable so making sure that they know this like before they leave that summer right and providing them with the platform providing them with videos providing them with like maybe weekly if you want to have like one 
um, a session a week or whatever, just different opportunities for them to come in, um, kind of work with the different platforms and also work with different educators so they have a, a better idea of what it looks like so that they could incorporate however it is that they do things into those same platforms. So I think just making sure that educators are extremely comfortable and just pushing, just making sure that it's an expectation that is going to be used, right? So um, using technology in the classroom, if you haven't done it before, can be extremely scary, right? And if somebody isn't, isn't there to hold you accountable to it, sometimes it's easy to kind of just fall into the same regimen that you've been doing things. But once you, once you have to use these platforms and you actually see why it's so amazing and just how much um, learners gain from it, I think it's something that's amazing. Um, and then it really just has to open the idea around, you know what, if I put myself out there and I try these new things, right, I'm going to get something from it. And those are the same lessons that we try to teach learners every single day. But sometimes as humans, right, it's still scary to kind of address change. Our experience with recruitment, it's, it's easy to recruit. We're, we're, we're kind of a popular school. Um, a lot of people know of the technology we have available, um, but we find our screening process has to be a little tighter because um, what used to be known as being tech savvy is no longer. And so there's a lot of applicants who feel like, oh yes, technology, I'm up on it, I like it, I use Microsoft Word all the time. And you know that's pretty much a basic requirement to be able to use Microsoft Word. So at this point, um, you know we manage probably about two or three different educational systems online, and so being able to manage all of those and create lessons that use the technology um, and manage all of the technology we use to communicate, it, it brings on a, it's kind of a different lifestyle right now in terms of what it means to understand and utilize technology. When you walk the hallways of the School of the Future, it becomes apparent that technology is not the only area where this school is providing a model for others to follow. Here at the school, I have a great opportunity to work with students with special needs, and um, so we focus on adapted PE. So I still have them in the gym every day, but we're doing activities that are geared towards them to, to their ability. Um, I also coach in a unified soccer program here. Um, it's been going on for, I guess I want to say maybe six years with the district, and it's a really cool program. Um, it's, a, it's a class that, that um, includes special ed kids and regular ed kids in the form of soccer. So we play um, every day, we do soccer drills, and then we do also do like different outreach programs. One campaign we run is called the R Word Campaign, and it's a campaign that reduces the use of the word retarded to bridge that gap that's between the regular ed and special ed population. Just bring leadership and um, positive climate to the school. Having those computers, being able to see videos of these different things, being able to kind of explore different projects and different activities that you can really just um, bring the outside world to them, right? So rather than feeling like you have to do these rote um, examples where you're just doing these things over and over and over again, while sometimes it might be helpful, I think also being able to kind of engage in mathematics in different ways and ways that you haven't seen and making it more meaningful is something that will get them excited around um, math, right? And also just kind of um, let them get a better understanding of what this concept is. Um, at the same time, like I said, having, having those notes, I think trying to teach ninth graders how to take notes, right? That's something that we have to start with the beginning, but also making sure that it's accessible to them at all times so that if they miss different, different, uh, certain things, they still have it. Um, using different um, online programs, right, that are already doing a lot of these cool math things, um, so you're not reinventing a wheel. Um, so just having that piece really just kind of expands what can happen in the classroom. We definitely want to keep and maintain and augment our technology fleet. So the concept of being one-to-one -one is still relevant to us. Um, we've been forced to kind of explore some other options, looking at kids and their cell phones and seeing can, you, can your cell phone really... Um, suffice in some instances. In some instances it's yes, in some it's no. Um, 
looking at exactly what we're trying to teach our kids about technology. I mean, we're looking at a fundamental difference of business email versus Gmail. And so although all of our kids have email accounts, they are much more prone to grab their phone and check their Gmail and then tell you, I didn't get an email from you when you have clearly sent it to their district created school mandatory account. You know, the challenges of technology are, are still there because there's a chasmic difference between casual technology through my phone, web-based apps like Gmail, and um, for example, for us using Outlook which is on your using OneNote, which is on your device. So um, right now we're just in, we're, we're kind of looking at an inventorying. Where is the technology? Where is that digital divide? And, and strategizing around what we want our focus to be moving forward in the next 10 years.